Hi, I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, where we discuss the ideas, people, and events that have made America what it is today. We believe that by understanding our history and our principles, we can better live up to the promise of the American founding and preserve our ongoing experiment in self-government. Welcome to The American Idea. I want to welcome everyone to this episode of The American Idea. Today, we're going to be talking with um, a person who probably needs no introduction, but I, I still, uh, decorum requires that I introduce him. Our listeners know him. Uh, many of you have read his works, been engaged by his lectures, uh, his public writings, Professor Robert George. And Professor George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University where he also directs the very wonderful James Madison Program on American Ideals and Institutions. He is a prolific author, as I mentioned, written a number of very important scholarly works, including in areas of things like natural law jurisprudence, and been one of the major leading public intellectuals in favor of civil discourse in American universities and a, a keen analyst of the threats and dangers to the kind of discourse in universities that our republic needs. Today, we're gonna to be talking about an article that he has written and an idea that he has been talking about now and bringing very important light to in public, the idea of identitarianism. What is it? Where did it come from? And what does it mean for American public life? Professor Robbie George, thanks for taking the time to join us today on the American idea. It's a great pleasure to be back on the show, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me. Identitarianism. Not a term that we necessarily have heard, uh, many of our listeners, but it's a term that you think deserves public understanding, public recognition, and some sort of public engagement. Help us understand what you mean by the term. Another term uh, capturing the same idea uh, or a very similar idea is the term tribalism. Uh, we talk about the polarization of our contemporary politics and not just our politics, our broader uh, culture. Uh, Americans treating each other as enemies, not friends who happen to disagree about important issues. Uh, for a healthy Republican democracy, citizens will recognize each other as civic friends, that is, as, as, as fellow citizens, even though they disagree, even when they disagree about important matters, because they recognize that in circumstances of freedom, it's natural that people will come to different conclusions, not just about the trivial, superficial, minor things in life, but even about big, important things, the great existential questions, questions of justice, the human good, human dignity, uh, human rights. But in an unhealthy, tribalistic situation, we come to think of each other as enemies. I'm in this tribe, that's my identity. You're in that tribe, that's your identity. Uh, tribes could be religious, they could be cultural, they could be ideological. But where tribalism, or what I call identitarianism, becomes fundamental, it gets out of control. It becomes what we regard as important about ourselves and other people, ultimately important about ourselves and other people. It is absolutely toxic, Jeff, to the enterprise of Republican democracy. Republics can't survive that kind of tribalism or identitarianism. Uh, you will recall, and I, I suspect many of your readers and um, listeners will recall, Federalist Number 10. Uh, James right. Madison in that uh, great uh, op-ed piece uh, written to persuade his fellow citizens to ratify the proposed Constitution. Uh, Madison asks a question, why have all previous republics failed? Why, why does republicanism always seem to collapse and collapse into the worst forms of tyranny? And why does he say the answer is why, why does that happen? Faction. Faction. Factions form around religions, around ideologies, around self-interest, economic self-interest, for example. And then people in fits of passion, in rages, come to see each other, not as fellow citizens who happen to disagree, but as enemies to be defeated and ultimately to be destroyed. 
and that results in the destruction always has of republics. So I care about this republic, Jeff, as I know you do, and I'm sure your listeners do. If you care about this republic, you've got to worry about this polarization, this tribalism, this identitarianism. When I see you, I shouldn't say, ah, there is a white conservative male guy person. You know, now, it, when I do look at you with my eyes, I see a white guy. I happen to know your views like mine are pretty okay. conservative. You, so it's you, an accurate you description of me. A male to me. But that's not what's fundamental about you as a human being. And I shouldn't engage you through a lens that's focused on race, class, and gender and ideology. There's a place for the discussion of those issues, but I shouldn't be thinking of myself categorically in those terms. And I shouldn't be forcing you into those categories as if those features were what are fundamental about, about you. So that's, uh, that's what identitarianism, and that's why I'm so deeply concerned about it, because I care about the success for ourselves and our posterity, for my grandchildren and yours and our great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren, the success of this great experiment in Republican government and morally ordered liberty. One of the things, is, as you know, that Madison says in Federalist Number 10 is that um, faction is thus sown in the very nature of man. It's not surprising mm -hmm. that there are factions. Um, but in your article, you argue that, in fact, identitarianism is a, a kind of toxic um, uh, worsening, poisoning of this aspect of human nature, which has always been there as long as there's been human nature. But the times that we live in with this kind of identitarianism, you trace it to something a little bit different than simply human nature being factious. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um human nature is factious. We are frail, fallen, fallible human beings. We are given to passions which can overwhelm our reasons. Now, it's passion is not bad in itself. I mean, it's good to have a passion for a good cause. It's good to have a passion for raising your children, right? It's good to have a passionate love for your spouse. These things can be good, but it's when passion gets out of line with reason and passion overwhelms reason and passion causes us to do things that in the cool light of reason, we ourselves would see are wrong and destructive. That's when things go uh, awry. And there is an ideo ideology. I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly, I'm, I'm on the conservative side and I'm perfectly willing to talk and will talk and have talked about the faults historically and today with my fellow conservatives. But gosh, on the left, we have a big problem today with identitarianism, what's sometimes called wokeness. And this is an, an understanding, a misunderstanding of human affairs that divides the social world up into two fundamental categories, oppressed and oppressor, persecutor and victim. And if you have certain characteristics like yours, Jeff, or mine, you're classed as a persecutor. It doesn't matter what you actually do or what you actually think or what you actually stand for, you are in the oppressor class. And if you have another set of characteristics, it doesn't matter again what you think or what you do. You're in the oppressed category. And then everything else gets reasoned out from there to the extent that reasoning is going on at all. And gosh, I mean, is that a recipe for misunderstanding the world or what? I mean, it's worse than a gross oversimplification. It's just a mistaken understanding of human affairs and of social life and of the human condition from the start. There's just no way you can think your way straight out of those premises. So what we've got to do is persuade people uh, of the error of those premises. Just stop thinking in these ideological terms. Stop dividing the world up into these two categories. Things are a lot more complicated, complex, and frankly interesting than that. So if we want to get at reality, we need to get these blinders off that are caused by the focus on race, class, and gender, the identitarianism, the division of the world up into these two categories. The the, the focus on race, class, and gender, um, especially on college campuses, which is what you have talked so much about, um, where does it, uh, some of our listeners, I'm sure, are, are wondering, where does it come from? Does it have intellectual roots? Does it have some kind of intellectual basis for it? 
um, beyond um, ordinary democratic politics? Uh, well, yeah, uh, we academics, uh, Jeff, people like you, the two of us, we, we like to trace the roots of things. I, and I get that. I do, I do too. I love doing this. Uh, the trouble is once you start, you know, there's no stopping point back to the Garden of Eden, ultimately end up with Adam and Eve and, the, <laughs> and the, the fall and eating the apple and disobeying God and wanting to be like God and all, all those uh, problems. But uh, I won't try to take it back <laughs> quite that far. Uh, much of the problem in contemporary ac academic life, I think, reflects the influence of various forms of what are sometimes called critical theory. Um, they became very fashionable when I was in college in the in the seventies, and then in the uh, and then in the eighties. Uh, the very leading figure when I was a student myself was Herbert Marcuse, who was a member of a school of revisionist Marxists. Uh, known as the Frankfurt School, the critical theory uh, school, as they were sometimes uh, called. Uh, they were the heirs of uh, Karl Marx. Now, uh, Marx's theory, as you know, was an economically deterministic uh, theory of society and of political economy. Uh, Marx uh, basically thought that the whole of human history uh, was a matter of conflict between the classes. It's the class struggle. It begins in the pre-capitalist uh, periods. Uh, and then with the Industrial Revolution and the rise of capitalism, it becomes a conflict between the owning class, the, the bourgeoisie and the petite bourgeoisie, the owners of the factories and other important uh, means of production, and then the owners of property, landlords, merchants, things like that. And then the working class, the proletariat, as it was uh, called. Uh, and Marx thought that the class struggle was itself driven by economic matters. So the big, the big division there was over who gets what in the pie of production. And the dynamics of society and history cause the capitalist system, cause the bourgeoisie and the, uh, and the petite bourgeoisie to more and more rigorously oppress the working class uh, to survive, actually, themselves in the capitalist competition, thus driving uh, the working class to the point at which it has nothing uh, to lose. And then the working class rises up. There is a violent workers' revolution. Uh, the revolution succeeds, establishes a dictatorship of the, of the proletariat. Um, the means of production are now transferred to the uh, working class themselves, and eventually we get the ultimate communist uh, utopia, which you know, Marx describes. He distinguishes the base, which is economic, from what he calls the superstructure, which uh, is cultural. So all the stuff that we see in the culture in the domains of religion and the arts and education and so forth, all of that is determined by the economic base, the relationships of the classes to the means of production in the particular period, which calls the mode of production. Um, well, um, by the early 20th century, not only had the workers' revolution and the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the withering away of the state not happened, but it was clear to clear-headed Marxists that it wasn't going to happen. So they began to see that Marx had made a mistake. But they didn't abandon the basic idea of the, of the struggle of classes. Um, uh, nor did they abandon Marx's materialism and atheism. But figures like Antonio Gramsci, the intellectual who was also leader of the Italian Communist uh, Party in the early part of the 20th century, eventually died in one of uh, Mussolini's uh, uh, prisons. Uh, Gramsci began to see that Marx had misunderstood really the relationship of the, the base and the superstructure, that uh, the workers' revolution wasn't going to come because the workers actually had a stake in the system. Uh, they were enjoying benefits of, of the system. They weren't gonna make a re revolution because they didn't want uh, a, a revolution. So if we're gonna bring about our communist ends, our Marxist ends, if we're going to establish communism, as it was his job to do as leader of the Italian Communist Party, we're gonna have to think about this a bit differently and we're gonna have to focus on cultural change rather than on exclusively on economic sorts of issues. And the class struggle may not be necessarily between the economic classes or classes 
in relationship to the to the means of uh, means of uh, production. So you get what emerges as a revisionist form of Marxism, sometimes called cultural Marxism. Um, no longer relying on the workers, damn them, they wouldn't do their part in bringing about the revolution, right. <laughs> not behaving themselves and doing what we Marxists uh, wanted them to do. Uh, so we're going to have to we're going to have to find our revolutionaries elsewhere. And a school of thought emerging from Germany, the new school uh, for social research, uh, the Frankfurt School, originally the Frankfurt School for Social Research, uh, many of whose members ended up uh, coming to the United States, fleeing the Nazis. Many of them were Jewish and fleed the, uh, the Nazis, uh, landed at places like um, the New School for Social Research in, in, uh, in New York and some other uh, prominent American academic institutions. They developed a, a, a revisionist Marxist view similar to, uh, they, were, they were barking up the same tree Gramsci was barking, uh, wh where the focus now is no longer on um, the, the economic divide, but more on the cultural sorts of issues, seeing the culture not as epiphenomenal or as a matter of the superstructure, but seeing as, itself as kind of the base. Um, and Marcuse was a late and leading figure in the uh, in the Frankfurt School. Uh, other figures were people like Theodore Adorno, Georgi uh, Lukács, uh, Max uh, Horkheimer, uh, Eric Fromm. Um, and they were very influential in American universities, especially in the 1960s and then 70s and 80s. And by the 70s, Marcuse is the leading uh, one. He wrote a very famous essay, became a little book, uh, called Repressive Tolerance, in which essentially he argues that bourgeois civil liberties values like freedom of speech, for example, uh, uh, are, are things that the left should fight for for itself, but not honor in other people like in conservatives that they should uh -huh. try to destroy conservatives, they don't need to respect the civil liberties of people who don't agree with them, that free speech was just a tool that should be used when it can be won by the left to advance uh, uh, to advance its goals. Uh, a German student radical um, coined the term the, the, the great march, or the long march through the institutions. Uh, and that idea, marching through the cultural institutions and winning them one by one, uh, is very much in the spirit of especially Marcuse's version of Frankfurt School uh, ideology. And now the, the, the makers of the revolution are not going to be workers because damn them, they wouldn't come along and do it. Right. Whether it's going to be students, intellectuals, members of minority groups, they're going to be the, the, the victims. They're going to be in the role of the workers under classical Marxism. And it's going to be the conservative, uh, uh, not only economic conservative, but social conservative. It's going to be the conservative element of the population that are going to count as the oppressors and who have to be overthrown and their institutions have to come under the control of uh, the new the new left. So that's, so that's my version of the story. So that's Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to learn a little more about the Ashbrook Center and how you can help us continue our work with teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chad Kiefer, a Director of Philanthropy and Strategic Partnerships here at Ashbrook. At its heart, America's story is about the lives of patriots who have given their last full measure of devotion to preserve and protect what it means to be an American. But the tragic truth is that the American story is being rewritten as one of oppression and despair. Back in 1776, the founders took a chance when they created a new government built on principles of liberty. They took a chance on America. Now I'm challenging you to do the same. Your gift to Ashbrook today reaches students, teachers, and citizens across the country, helping them to understand why America is worthy of their devotion. With so many forces eroding our history and taking away from our principles, isn't it time we give America a chance? Your investment is encouraged now more than ever. Please visit us today at ashbrook.org backslash support. So that's very interesting because it's so then it's through thinkers like Marcuse, as you say, that in, in American universities, people start to think of themselves not, as you first said, fellow citizens, fellow Americans, uh, fellow pursuers of truth, 
the old fashioned might, might even call them old fashioned liberal values of universities, but as members of a certain race, a certain class, a certain gender, a certain victimology. And they learn through Marcuse and others to see themselves first and foremost and always as that primarily. That's correct. What about then, what is the, the critique of the reply of old fashioned liberals um, who still exist in universities and who certainly existed in the 70s and 80s saying, no, 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 the struggle is for a common humanity. So all lives matter. Um, for example, the old fashioned liberal would say and being critique of conservatives, of course, but what, what, what about that group in universities? What has happened to them over time? You know, Jeff, uh, when I arrived at Princeton back in the Middle Ages, 1985, I came in the fall of 1985, right out of uh, graduate school. Um, when I arrived, I was the only out of the closet full bore conservative that I knew on the Princeton campus. Huh. There were a couple of Republicans, but they would uh, go out of their way to point out that they were, uh, what did uh, the late Bob Gilpin call himself? A Vermont Republican, that's right. He called himself a Vermont uh, yeah. Republican. <laughs> they were meant to distinguish him from me. <laughs> who was a full bore, you know, social uh, and economic uh, uh, and foreign policy conservative. Um, uh, so there were a couple of, you know, sort of moderate kind of conservatives, uh, not really conservatives, but Republicans. Uh, and then the place was run, dominated by the people you just asked me about, the old school liberals. They owned Princeton and every other university that I knew, every other major university that I, that I knew. They were it, they were in charge. And, and thank God they were, at least from my point of view, because they were people who, although they didn't always practice what they preached perfectly, did preach tolerance, the need for diversity of ideas, freedom of speech. And a lot of those people were really good people and they really meant it. I didn't agree with them politically. They were old fashioned liberal Democrats. I by then had outgrown that <laughs> and, become a, uh, and become a conservative. But they were willing to allow me, they hired me. There were no conservatives to hire me. They hired me, the old school liberals. They gave me tenure. They installed me in my endowed chair at, uh, at Princeton. They enabled me to found the James Madison program, which is now in its 23rd year. We were founded in, on July 4th of the year uh, 2000. Um, but you know what, they're gone, or all but gone. They're now in their 70s or 80s, those who are left. And by and large, they have not been replaced by people who share their commitment to old fashioned, traditional civil, liber civil libertarian liberalism. Their successors are not the sort who were uh, particular about freedom of speech and protecting that value or other basic civil liberties. The, the, I, I'm shocked to find at this stage that the old school liberals are like dinosaurs. Hmm. Almost extinct. Well, dinosaurs are extinct. They're almost like dinosaurs because they're almost <laughs> uh -huh. extinct and, and they haven't replaced them themselves with people who share their values. Now, there are actually many more conservatives at Princeton today than there were when I arrived, at least many more out of the closet conservatives. There, there are probably 25 or more of us on the campus. But if you look at the pushback against the sort of woke identitarians, it's not coming from the old school liberals because there aren't enough of them left or they're not active in the way that they used to be. They've been pushed out and they're held in contempt by the woke. The woke despise them more than they dislike the conservatives. It's, it's really amazing. Really? But there are very few of the old school ones around. So the pushback is coming from the you know, relatively small handful of conservatives, not from the old school liberals. Now, the old school liberals, if they're around for a faculty vote, will, will vote the right way. And when it comes to academic politics, if there's a free speech issue or something like that on the campus, but they're not leading the charge, at least at Princeton. As far as I can see, it's really the, the, the conservatives who are, who, are, who are leading the charge here and allied with what's left of the old school liberals, at least when push comes to shove in a faculty meeting or where there's a well, yeah, I mean, you, you certainly famously have been um, in partnership with someone like Cornell West, um, who is clearly a man of the left, but you, you all have, um, both at Princeton and around the country, have spoken very eloquently and had com public conversations about the 
importance of deliberation, of dialogue, of, of thinking through. Cornell is certainly a man of the left. Um, it, are you saying, suggesting that even in the modern university, there's it's even difficult for a person like him? Oh, yeah. I mean, he was telling me the most remarkable story the other day of a faculty colleague where he's now teaching at Union Theological Seminary, a younger faculty colleague, objecting to him teaching writings of W.E.B. Du Bois and John Dewey. You know, How, I mean, what could be objectionable from object? the left about Du Bois? Uh, du Bois did not have sufficiently woke views about women. Or gender, I'm sorry, not allowed to say women. Gender, didn't have sufficiently woke views about gender. So she objected to Cornell assigning readings from Du Bois. I mean, this is through the looking glass crazy if you're objecting to Cornell West assigning the writings of W.E.B. Du Bois. But that shows you how crazy things have gotten in mainstream academic life. And a person like Cornell, who is very much a man of the left and, and an and a honorary chairman of Democratic Socialists of America, he's running for president on the Green Party, uh, uh, under the Green Party banner, but still his old fashioned civil libertarianism, his firm, strong, beautiful belief in freedom of expression and the need for viewpoint diversity and the need for civil but robust discourse marks him as somebody who's not sufficiently with the woke program. And so he can come under attack. I mean, how crazy is that? Yeah, it's remarkable. Uh, looking out in the landscape, maybe uh, both the landscape of the university, but the broader American public landscape, what do you think the prospects are for containing identitarianism, rolling it back, engaging it in such a way as to perhaps raise it to a higher, better plane? We shall overcome. Uh, it's really up to us. There, there's nothing that's written in the stars. There's no determined course of history. This is another Marxist myth. Marx picks it up from Hegel, of course, the idea that there's a, a determined future, uh, that, uh, that history has a specific uh, trajectory. Um, uh, Barack Obama used to say all the time uh, that if you don't agree with him about this, that, or the other thing, you're going to be on the wrong side of history. It's a very foolish thing to say because anybody who stops to think about it for 15 seconds will realize that there are no sides to history. History doesn't have sides. Uh, history is a contingent, impersonal sequence of events. It has no more power to judge than a stone outcropping or a carved and painted totem pole. It's simply a kind of progressive secularism's substitute for uh, uh, for God, really, for, for a God of, who, who renders judgment and, and pronounces verdict on our moral or immoral uh, actions. History has just been put in there since God has been pushed out of the picture in this ideology. He's just put in there to play the role of God judging uh, what was right and what was uh, wrong. It's all very silly when you, when you think about it for 15 seconds, but people don't bother to think about it for 15 seconds. And even the President of the United States can pop onto the TV screen like, frequently and say, yeah, if you don't agree with me on this, you're on the wrong side of history. Now, the lesson there for us is that we get to make history. Do we have the courage? Will we exercise the leadership? Will we make the sacrifices? Will we take the stand to make things come out this way because it's right and good and true rather than that way? One thing we desperately need in this country, Jeff, is role models for our young people. Here's you want something based on mine now in my 39th year, my 38 plus years of experience in academic life teaching young men and women. You want a lesson for me on this? Here's my lesson. What these kids need more than anything else is role models. They need people who model what it means to be a determined truth seeker and a courageous truth speaker. Yes, we need to teach them by precept. There's no substitute for that. We have to use words we have to tell them about things. Don't preach at them. Engage them in conversation. So we need to we need to proclaim our values, teach them freedom of speech, the importance of listening, 
recognizing one's own fallibility, um, practicing the virtues of things like intellectual humility and courageous witness. Cornell tries to do that. I try to do that. We need to teach by precept. But even more importantly, Jeff, is that we have to teach by example. Kids learn more from our example than from our precept. If they see you or me or Cornell or anybody else standing up and saying things even when they're unpopular because they're true and bearing the slings and arrows that will come if you speak unpopular truths, they're going to they're gonna be inspired by that. And that will enable them to overcome the natural fears that without those examples would simply paralyze them and prevent them from acting. But when they see it being done, they're inspired to do it themselves. For our listeners, for that kind of inspiration, what, what do you want a young person to read today to say, to have that kind of encounter, to start really thinking for themselves in the way that you're describing? Well, the, the work that set me off on my own vocation that got me rethinking everything, got me thinking, got me out of a tribal mentality when I was just 19 years old, was Plato's dialogue, Gorgias. So just based on my own experience, if students ask me, what should I read? Uh, what, what, will, what will awaken me from my dogmatic slumbers if you think I'm dogmatically slumbering? I say, well, let's begin with Plato's Gorgias. But really, virtually any Platonic dialogue, I, I'm still trying to figure out what the Republic means. I, that's such a problem. <laughs> so are we I, all. <laughs> I, don't necessarily, I don't necessarily think that one is the one to begin with. But the Apology, um, uh, the Credo, the, the, the Euthyphro, the Phaedra. But for me, my own personal story begins with, the, with Gorgias. But it's not just the old books, although, boy, I love starting with the old books. Uh, and while we're on the subject of the old books, not quite as old, but still old, St. Augustine's Confessions. Read Augustine's wrestling with the great questions, his transformative intellectual and spiritual and moral experiences. And then, as, you know, you move forward through, through history, the writings of people like Erasmus and, and Thomas More, the writings of the great Enlightenment figures, the writings of the American founders, Federalist Number 10, for example. Uh, and then, you know, moving forward, um, uh, great works of literature like Austin's Pride and Prejudice. What, I mean, gosh, what a, what a perceptive uh, person she was at understanding human nature. Uh, 19th century figures like, well, John Stuart Mill. I've been a critic of various aspects of Mill's thought, especially his utilitarianism and his libertarianism uh, for most of my academic uh, career. A lot of my academic career has been really focused on criticizing these aspects of Mill. But there are other respects in which I find him so insightful. Um, and even where I'm critical of him, I learn from him. Same with John Henry Newman, with whom I tend to agree more. Now, Newman's idea of a university is a very great book, very great thing for students uh, to read, especially when they're in the process themselves of going through a university education. Or into the 20th century, read C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. It's just a great work to get you thinking about whether I should have a more critical perspective about my contemporary culture, my contemporary intellectual culture, the stuff I'm being fed uh, so often in my uh, classes and in, through the media and so forth. Um, Martin Luther King's Letter from Birmingham Jail, very powerful. There, there's a work that'll get you uh, uh, thinking. Um, uh, there are lots of great books that, that students can read from those going deep into the past to those of our contemporary life. Alastair McIntyre's After Virtue has been a very transformative book for a great uh, many, uh, many people. Um, going back into the 18th century, uh, Edmund Burke's writings. Um, you know, gosh, where do you stop, right? Yeah, you, no, there's so many. There's, there's, so there's, many. There's, there's so much great stuff to read. There's, you know, in a certain way, there's just no excuse for us as a people today to be in the sorry state that we're in intellectually when even within our own culture, and I haven't even started to talk about, you know, what's available from the East, for example, and from other, other cultures, but just what's available in our culture, you know, we should be an intellectually flourishing civilization. But somehow we're not, and we need to recover that. And the resources are right there in the great books. And by the great books, I do mean Plato and Augustine and so forth, but not just those. 
I mean all the way into the 19th and 20th and now 21st centuries. Those are wise, wise words of advice and inspiration for our listeners um, based on a lifetime experience and thinking. Robbie George, thank you for taking the time to help us understand this problem in contemporary public life, but also the possibility for renewal, for in, in engaging out of this problem to something higher and better. Thank you again for taking the time to join us today on The American Idea. My very great pleasure, Jeff. Thanks so much and God bless you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.